Good evening and welcome to Allegiant Church and Creative Ministries. Woohoo! All right. Good to see everybody tonight. Um, good to see those of you live and um, good to know that you're out there on the video stream, even though I can't see you right now. But uh, talk to us. We'd love to chat back and forth with you and uh, let us know of your prayer requests and so forth. Uh, we do want to go to the Lord in prayer for those prayer requests that have been coming in. There's quite a few right now. I, I won't mention them all for sake of privacy and so forth, but uh, our uh, Bishop McKenzie in Kenya, if you guys haven't seen that yet, he's uh, his wife and his baby are in two different hospitals today. Um, so some tough time, and she just, uh, his wife just lost her dad a um, short time ago. So they've, they've had a kind of a... a and all the COVID stuff's going on over there and everything. It's, they've had a rough time. So uh, let's remember Bishop and uh, Phoebe tonight and uh, and the baby um, as they go through all of this stuff. And uh, remember all the prayer requests that have come in and uh, everything that's been mentioned. So, again, if, if you have prayer requests that we don't know about, please send them in. We want to pray with you on those things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. And we just ask you tonight that you would be with us. Forgive us of our sins. Uh, cleanse us of, of every in, in unrighteousness and make us pure and holy in your sight. Father, we pray that you'll heal us of diseases, that you will uh, deliver us from oppression and depression and uh, all the things that bind us. Father, we just ask you tonight that you would teach us, that we would have ears to hear what your spirit says to the church and that you would help us uh, during these days that we live to be wise and to have the strategies of the sons of Issachar to know what we need to do. And we thank you for it in Jesus name. Everybody said amen. Amen. All right. So we've been looking at honor the last couple of weeks and I think we're going to probably try to wrap it up tonight. So I'm going to do a quick recap and then we're going to kind of dig in. Uh, part of it is that we just have a culture of disrespect. Um. That's pretty obvious, I think, anywhere we look today that uh, it's just more and more and more people are, especially online, willing to say anything, um, willing to be disrespectful and, and feel like they have some righteous cause by telling people off or whatever, uh, not treating people in the way that the Bible intends us to treat people, which is to treat them as the image bearers of God, because that's what they are. And... Um, we need to be careful of that, especially in the church. It's, I'm, I'm saddened, really, honestly, as I watch things happening right now, that uh, the church is just too much like the world. The church is, it, the world does something, and the church thinks they can do it too. They think they can act like the rest of everybody else out there, and um, that is not something that we uh, should be doing. We should be acting like royalty we should be acting like princes and princesses and and we should be above the fray we should be modeling civility to a uncivilized world amen all right honor honor is about what you would say and how you would act if you met jesus face to face and then realize that we are his um image bearers and that we are his ambassadors and we should uh, do unto others as we would have them do unto us Matthew seven twelve, and we should love our neighbor as ourself all right and uh, we talked about if you're going to change culture uh, you're going to have to begin with 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 your mind everything starts in the mind James talks about that sin is conceived first in the mind and so we see the mind which then we can change, work on our attitude, then we can work on our lifestyle, then we can finally work, work on the culture. Um, in case you're wondering, it takes anywhere from five to seven years to change cultures. So it's not something that happens quickly. Uh, it's certainly not going to happen within the lifetime of a single administration, for example. Um, what we're seeing now is not the effect of one administration, it's the effect of of the world around these administrations for years and years and years and where we've hit it. I was talking with my girls the other night about um, Harry Truman. Now, Harry Truman was uh, a Democrat, and but he was very, very different from today's Democrats and uh, very different than any politician, I think, today. But one of the things I loved about uh, Harry Truman, the stories told about him, that he would... Uh, 
when he was traveling, of course, his travel was different than our modern presidents. He would be on trains or whatever. And uh, he would, if he was away from his wife, Bess, for the night, he would write her a letter. And he would he, he'd carry a book of stamps around in his shirt pocket. And so he'd write her a letter and he'd pull out his book of stamps and he would put the stamp on the envelope and ask somebody to put it in the mailbox for him. And uh, one of his staff members said, Mr. President said, we'll be glad to put postage on that for you. And he said, I don't think the American people should pay for my personal correspondence. And can you imagine <laughs> how different is that today? Um, but that's character, and we need more character. Um, not, I, I didn't say we need more characters. I said we need more character, right, just to make sure we're clear on that. Um, Roman tw Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Uh, honor always begins by looking at other people first. It always begins by what is good for them. How do I help them? How do I serve? Because Jesus said that if we want to be leaders, we have to be what? Servants. That's right. Uh, if you want to be great, you have to be least, right? So it's about, <coughs> and what did Jesus do? He came and he served. Amen. So be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. 1 Timothy 5.17, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially to those who are hard at work preaching and teaching. And, uh, and that's, that's unfortunate. It's not just amongst the clergy, but also amongst any professionals nowadays. Uh, there used to be a, a deep respect in our culture for doctors and attorneys and um, pastors and teachers and whatever and now it seems like it's like we don't respect anybody anymore it's like hardly anybody gets any respect and, and I realize that there's been some bad apples that have created some of that feeling but how many of you know we shouldn't be judging everybody by a few bad apples we shouldn't be judging all police officers by what some of them do we shouldn't be judging all doctors because some of them do bad things um, and we've become suspicious, we've become fearful, and we have begun to devalue everybody. And uh, the church is not meant to do that. We are to we are to value everyone, even when they mess up. We talked last week about how honor extracts anointing. So when you give honor to someone, you extract anointing from them. Uh, humility sustains anointing. You're not going to you're not going to continue in your anointing if you don't if you're not humble about it. And then holiness protects anointing. And so tonight we're going to begin with Matthew 13, 44. Beginning in uh, again in verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So what did the man buy? A field? And what's a field got in it? What? Dirt. Right? I don't know if it had crops in it or not, but we know it had dirt. So why would you go buy a bunch of dirt? Why'd this man go buy a bunch of dirt? Because, because he knew something was in it. What did he know was in it? A treasure. What are we made out of? Dirt. But how many of you know there's a treasure inside of each of us that God has put in there? So when we look at people, we shouldn't be seeing their dirt. We should be looking for their treasure. Let that sink in just a little bit. Because it's very easy to look at people's dirt, isn't it? But we should be looking for the treasure. The cloak of honor. If we look in the tabernacle, we see that the ark was hidden behind badger skins. So dead animal skins. Skin, flesh, right? Jesus was born of questionable birth. You think that affected his ministry at all? Absolutely it did. 
What happened when he went to his hometown? He couldn't do many miracles, right? So everywhere else he was seeing great miracles happen. Why couldn't he see miracles happen in his hometown? They only saw him as the guy that they, they grew up with. They only saw him as a carpenter's son. They only saw you receive what you perceive. Right? So as a matter of fact, the Bible goes further than that, doesn't it? It says they were offended by him. How dare he come teach us? How dare he be doing these miracles? How dare he be? They were upset because he was getting credit that they wanted. They were jealous. They were offended. They were looking at his earthly background. Don't you imagine some of them were going, I heard that, him, that Mary and Joseph weren't even married when she had him. Hmm? And because they only focused on his flesh, his dirt, if you will, not that he had sin, but just dirt in the sense that the flesh is made of dirt. They couldn't receive anything from him. Does that mean he was less powerful when he was with them? No, it wasn't about what he had, was it? It was about what they believed. So how many times do we miss what God is trying to do in our life because of what we believe? How many times do we not receive from somebody God sends our way for us to receive from because we don't believe in them? We don't look for the treasure inside of them. We just see things about them we don't like. Maybe we don't like the way they talk. Maybe we don't like the way they comb their hair. Maybe we don't like the clothes they wear. Maybe they, we don't like something else. And instead of looking for the treasure that God has placed inside of them, we're offended by their outward appearance or were offended by where they came from or were offended by the way they talk or were offended by their age or maybe they're younger than we are and they shouldn't have that gift or whatever it happens to be. And when we begin the relationship with offense, we can't expect anything to come of it. We see that Judas kissed Jesus to reveal him. What's that tell us? It tells us that there was nothing remarkable about Jesus. He wasn't glowing in the dark. So when the people who had decided they were going to come kill him, come take him away and kill him, were looking for him, they needed Judas to point out which one it was. Because he looked so much like everybody else in the, in the crowd. That's revealing, isn't it? Because we see those pictures with the halo on top of his head. Or maybe we watch those movies where he's got blue eyes. I've never seen a Jew with blue eyes, but I guess on the movies he does. Not 100% Jew anyway. <laughs> and they're not even normal blue eyes. They're like, whoa, blue eyes, right? Great contacts. Almost bless you. Uh, <laughs> So, th but that's not it, does it? As a matter of fact, what did Isaiah say? Isaiah said that there was nothing about him that would draw us to him. So we, we see these pictures that were made in the, you know, hundreds of years ago where Jesus is, they use a European model. How many of you know Jesus did not look like the pictures of Jesus that we have? We don't know what he looked like, but we know he did not look like a European model. Okay, we're, we're pretty sure on that one. <laughs> Even the oldest pictures of Jesus are hundreds of years after he was gone. So we, we don't know what he looked like. But what we do know from Scripture is there was nothing attractive about him except for God inside of him. But his physical nature, all of that, he just looked like the rest of the disciples. He looked like the common fisherman. He looked like everybody else to the point where Judas had to go and actually point him out to the people that were going to take him away. 
makes us think a little differently, don't it? Because that's not the way we see him portrayed in movies, is it? He's always above the crowd. He's always out of the distance. He's always shining greater than everybody else. But the Bible says that's not what it was like. People were attracted to him because they expected something from him because they saw God working, God the Father working through his life. He said, I can only do what I see my father doing, right? But from a fleshly standpoint, he was just dirt like the rest of us. So all of these things, it, it, it puts a nature. How many of you ever heard of the, uh, these auctions or yard sales or whatever where somebody goes and they buy this painting and then all of a sudden they, they start working on it and they realize there's another painting behind that and the painting that's behind it is actually worth a fortune, Right? Well, that's kind of what we're talking about, isn't it? Because what's on our outside, what most people perceive us to be, what most people perceive other people to be, is just that old painting that may have some attractiveness to it, but it's really not that great, and we didn't pay much for it. But if we dig a little deeper and we'll look and see what God has put in their life, we may end up finding a lot of value in that relationship or a lot of value in what they have to offer us. As one person once put it, I believe it was Reggie. I can't remember his last name right now. Uh, but uh, I believe it was him that I first heard it from. He said, uh, God gives some of your keys to other people. And if you don't honor those other people, you'll never get the keys. So the keys to your destiny are often hidden in other people. And if you, if you regard them as just being common, if you regard them as just being flesh, if you regard them as just being unimportant, then you're never going to get the keys. So you could, be, you could be circumnavigating your own future, your own destiny, because of the way you treat other people. That's big, isn't it? All right. So looking for gold. How many of you know you have to mine a ton of dirt to get an ounce of gold? Gold miners aren't looking for the dirt, though, are they? They're looking for the gold. Their focus is on where that gold is. Their focus is, they don't care how many rocks or how much dirt they have to move, they're going to get to the gold. Jezebel spirit, what's it look for? The dirt. So, who was the, before Jesus, who was the greatest prophet that ever lived? Before that, Jesus did say John the Baptist was the greatest, but he was only six months older than Jesus, so I wouldn't count that. Elijah, right? Elijah's the greatest. Now, he, he didn't do as many miracles as Elisha did. Elisha did twice as many miracles as him, but Elijah was the mentor that made Elisha possible. So Elijah's considered, and remember, Elijah went up in the, in the whirlwind. Elijah was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Jesus, uh, so Elijah is treated as probably the most important um, prophet, at least in that sense. Moses and Abraham obviously are important prophets too. But as far as powerful anointing, that was Elijah. So he stopped it from raining for three and a half years. He did all these different miracles. He he through God. I mean, he God did it, but through him, he called down fire from heaven and consumed not only the. Uh, the sacrifice, but the whole altar. After all, and killed the prophets of Baal. As far as we know, he killed the prophets of Asherah too. So, 850 prophets. And what's Jezebel's response to all that? Oh, you've got a great God, I'm going to serve him, right? That wasn't Jezebel's response, was it? Her response was, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you before the end of the day. I love what she says here. I mean, I'm being sarcastic here a little bit, but I'm saying, ironically, here's what she says. She says, may my gods deal with me ever so severely if you live through the day. And I'm like, you talking about the same gods that allowed 850 of your prophets and priests to die? You talk about the same one that ignored you when you cut yourself and cried, or your your prophets cr cut themselves and cried out for attention. 
Talking about the same ones that couldn't do anything about the last three and a half years of drought? Wow. But we see that in the church today, don't we? We see people who keep going back to the things that are proven not to work and ignoring God. They give God lip service. They'll even post about God on Facebook. They'll even post some scriptures. I, I'm just absolutely very concerned about the state of the church now when we've got people that that just they, they'll talk about God all day long. They'll talk about the prophetic things. They'll talk about what's going on, blah, 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 blah. But yet they, they don't care about the things of God. They're not involved in the things of God. They're not fulfilling what God has called them to do. They're stepping back and looking at a distance. All the while telling everybody, yep, the Bible says that's going to happen. You think if they really believe that, they would actually be doing their life the way God wants them to do it. Wouldn't you? It reminds me of, of John the Baptist. We, we mentioned this briefly in the, in the um, commentaries. But when, when Herod took John the Baptist... It said that he would call him to come and speak because he liked listening to him. He considered him a holy man. Think about that for a minute. So Herod considers John a holy man. He believes that he's speaking for God, but yet he arrests him and ignores what he tells him he needs to do. He tells, the, the whole reason he got arrested, if you remember, was that he told Herod that it was unlawful for him to have his brother's wife. And his brother's wife is the one who got him arrested. And then it was her daughter that had him killed. So he actually allowed this sin in his life to destroy something he actually believed was godly at his own hand, or his own word. And I see the same thing happening in the church today where people, they tout God, they talk about God, they believe the prophetic word, they believe all these things, but yet they live a life as if they talk about Jesus coming back any time now, but then they act like he ain't never coming back. How did we become so duplicitous? How did we how did we become to a place where we're so full of cognitive dissonance? You know what that means? We have, we have a whole world full of cognitive dissonance now. Here's what cognitive dissonance is for any of you who care to know. Cognitive dissonance is when you believe one thing but you act like you don't believe it. You live your lifestyle in a way that's opposite of what you actually believe. And eventually, that will cause some kind of psychotic break if you don't get it straightened out. Because you will always be fighting against your own morality, against your own self. And this is not Christian psychology. This is regular psychology. Psychologists aren't so concerned about what you believe as how much you're consistent with the belief system that you have. And we, we have a church loaded down with cognitive dissonance today. We've got people in the, in the pews that say they believe one thing, but then act like they don't. We've got ministers that say they believe one thing and act like they don't. Moving on. Pastor Ron says it this way. I have to honor what I don't like so I can get what I like. In other words, I've got, I've got to honor the person even though I see things about them that I don't like in order to draw out of them the things that I need, the things that I want. Now, all of us do that to some degree, right? But we need to be more, what's the word I'm looking for, intentional? We need to be more intentional about it. For example, if you're, if you're in business, Right. 
there are some people that they're not your most favorite people in the world when they show up, right? Don't y'all lie. But you're nice to them anyway, right? Because they got something you want or something you need or something your boss needs or wants. Maybe money. And so even though maybe they maybe they don't talk to you nice, maybe they cuss every other word, maybe they whatever, right? But somehow, isn't it interesting how somehow we can do that in the business world and not think a second thing about it? But in the church, we have trouble putting up with our brother or sister because of things. Because we don't realize that although we may not be getting that tangible reward of money or whatever it is out of them, that there's something spiritual inside of them that God wants us to get or something he wants us to learn through them. Which is even more valuable than what you're doing in your secular life. Is that making sense? And we need to think of it more from that perspective. It, if, I can, if I can live my life in the secular world in a way that I can, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that most of you are like me. There may be days where it's like some people are just a little overwhelming and you don't really want to deal with them. But you're not spending all your time thinking, I hate that person, I don't like that person. I, we don't, we as Christians don't do that, do we? Hopefully. All right. Um, and, there, and there's people... There's people that I legitimately like. I just don't like their actions sometimes. And certainly we're to love everybody. But I, it seems like we don't worry as near as much about it when it's out there as we do when it's in here. Why is that? We should be more bearing with those that love Jesus, shouldn't we? Because they're family. And it's true that we're often more lenient with sinners than we are with Christians. A sinner sins every second of the day and you don't think anything of it. Your brother or sister falls one time and boy, you're beating them up for the next 10 years. Oh, I'm starting to preach now, ain't I? <laughs> As somebody said a long time ago, the church is the only army that Kills their wounded. Yeah. So how do how do we get better at this? And how do we realize that we're hurting ourselves when we do that? Number six, twenty two through twenty seven. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons to bless the people of Israel with this special blessing. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Whenever Aaron and his sons bless the people of Israel in my name, I myself will bless them. That's powerful. But you know what makes it even more powerful? Is he gave them this right after the golden calf experience. So these guys, God had saved them. I think we talked about this before. God saves them out of Egypt. Moses is on the mountain getting the laws of God, getting instructions to build the tabernacle, getting instructions on how to structure the leadership within the camp. And while he's doing that, they take the gold out of their ears that God has provided them through the people of Egypt they give it to Aaron, who is designated to be the high priest. He hasn't been a consecrated yet, but he's getting ready to be. God's talking about it up on the mountain. He melts it all down, creates a golden calf for him, and then says, Behold the God who brought you out of Egypt. That's about as big a slap in the face as you can do. Meanwhile, now there's, there's some pain, there's some pain that, that comes with that. But after, after that's over, after Moses has interceded for them, after God has, has come back to not destroying them, 
He's now telling them, here's a blessing that I want you to put on the people. Wow. Now, let's put this in perspective for a minute. This is Old Testament. Now, this sounds an awful lot like grace to me. Sounds an awful lot like mercy to me. So this idea that God was one way in the Old Testament and a different way in the New Testament just it doesn't really fly, does it? So, whenever Aaron and his sons bless the people of Israel in my name, I myself will bless them. So we see that from the Lord, he goes, the Lord gives it to Moses, who gives it to Aaron, who gives it to his sons, who gives it to his people. So let's look at that. The Lord is perfect in all his ways, right? How about Moses? Is he perfect in all of his ways? Nope. What about Aaron? Is he perfect in all of his ways? Nope. How about his sons? Two of them got killed real quick, didn't they? And how about the people? Are they perfect in all their ways? But in order to get the blessing of God, the people had to go through the sons of Aaron who had to go through Aaron who had to go through Moses before they could get the blessing of God. A lot of intercessors, a lot of go-betweens, and a lot of people that weren't perfect. How, how many of you, and you don't have to answer this, this is rhetorical, okay, but, but how many of us, let me put it that way, would have really, if, let's say we had been on the Levite side, because you remember Moses said, who's on God's side? And they, the Levites are the ones that came to Moses' side. They're the ones that went through the camp and killed people on behalf of God. So they were the ones who did not participate in the, in the idolatry at the bottom of Mount Sinai. Now they're being told they've got to follow the guy who made the idol. How many of us might have bucked at that? It's not always as clear cut as we think it is, is it? When we talk about God's ways being mysterious, they're more mysterious than we think they are. And he will use who he chooses to use. And we don't always get why he uses somebody. We don't understand why he would allow this person who's done all this stuff to be his messenger. But our responsibility is to honor them so that we can get from them what God gave them for us. That's tough, ain't it? This might be the most challenging message I've given all year so far. It's tough. I'm telling you from my own sense of pain. It's hard when I see some of the people that God puts up there and it's like, why them? Right? It's easy to ask that question. But when we ask that question, we're not honoring God because we're not honoring them. All right, let me take a quick break and see what questions you guys might have or comments, thoughts. One thing I don't like about this format is you guys are awful quiet. Online, type them in. They'll let me know. Anybody? All right. Well, we're going to move on. and But go ahead and write them in if you want, and we will come back to it. Matthew 1041. And I think we touched on this last week. That he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. So we get what we treat others as. So that's pretty good when you think about it. We don't have to we don't necessarily have to do all the pain and the work that a prophet does. We just got to receive what God put inside of them for us and then we get their reward. That's pretty cool, ain't it? 
Maybe we should look at this the positive way instead of the hard way. Now, does that mean the prophets are always right? No. And, and that's, a, that's a tough thing. That's a tough discerning moment because we're still caught, especially in the New Testament, the, the nature of prophets have changed from the First Testament to the Second Testament. We need to understand that. What the prophets were in the Old Testament is not what prophets are today. There are still elements of the Old Testament prophets or the First Testament prophets in the prophets today, but they're a different class um, because God speaks to us personally. Remember, at the bottom of Mount Sinai, the people told Moses, don't let God speak to us. You, you talk to him and then tell us what he said. So they were actually asking God not to speak to them, but today we are to expect God to speak to us through the Holy Spirit, right? So today, prophets become, normally become more of a, um, um, a confirmation of what God is already speaking to us. In my opinion, and I don't, I don't really have statistics to back up my numbers, but at least 90% of the time, at least in my experience, you should already know what God's getting ready to say to you before the prophet says it. Now, you may be fighting it, you may be struggling with it, but when the prophet says it, it should bear witness with you that God's speaking it. And I found that to be true in, in ministry as I've prayed for people and things like that. Um, almost all of the time, if I say something, they already know it. They may be fighting it. They may be struggling with it. But all, all God's using me for is not, to, is not to guide them and direct them, but just to confirm that it is God that's speaking to them. Does that make sense? Um, and then when we get on the grander scale of prophets, I won't get into all that tonight, but when we get on the grander scale of prophets, um, that's, a, that's a totally different world. And um, that's what's getting us into trouble right now in the church. And um, I continue to be concerned that there's not a bigger call for, um, for correction to be brought into the body of God. I've watched on many of the, on many of the Christian platforms to see and for the most part is being ignored and and this it, it isn't new that they've missed stuff and it haven't been called to the accountability it's just the first time they've missed something that basically the whole world knew about and now they're not being called to accountability by much of the church there's two things that are going on in the church right now one is you've got the ones that say, see i told you so and all they're doing is bashing and they're not helpful. And you got the other side over here that's like, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. And yes, it does. Because we need accountability in the body of Christ. And I, I regret that we don't have a council of bishops anymore. I regret that we don't have a council of Nicaea or a council of Jerusalem or, or something else where great men and, and women of God can come together and, and, and judge prophecy. Because it's needed desperately. I was told recently, and I hope they don't mind me repeating it because I won't use names or anything, but I was told recently of someone who, um, who God spoke and said, God told me not to go to church. Okay? Now, why am I using that as an example? Because the word of God is very clear that we are to be in fellowship with one another. So in order, to, in order to believe that God spoke that, you have to completely be delusional about what the Word of God says or believe that somehow you're above the Word of God. He is not going to contradict himself. And so I just use that as an example to say, I see that all the time in different ways. That just happens to be a fairly recent one. But people will say, oh, God. Well, here, here's a great one. Here's one that I've seen for over the years. Some of you know this one, too. God gave me that man. God gave me that woman. The fact that I was married at the time had, you know, that didn't matter. I've heard preachers do that. It's like, guess what, dude? God don't work that way. <laughs> It's 
So I'm back to my, uh, I'm speaking, preaching two messages tonight. I don't know why, but one's on this cognitive dissonance, I think, because it, it's bothering me so much to see what's happening in the world right now. Let me wrap this up. Second Corinthians 5, 16. <laughs> So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. In other words, there's going to be folks out there that are going to be acting wacko. We should not participate in their wackiness. Okay? <laughs> At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, but how differently we know him now. I will choose to honor those whom God has placed in my life I will receive the treasure he has hidden for me in them. That should be our motto tonight. Let me read it again. I will choose to honor those whom God has placed in my life, even when I don't necessarily agree, even when they frustrate straight the snot out of me. Excuse me, my southern term coming out. I will receive the treasure he has hidden for me in them. So, And I hope, I hope I'm very clear on this. I am frustrated by what's going on. It does not mean I don't love the people that it's coming from. I, if you noticed, I have not been using names about a lot of things that are going on right now because I'm not trying to attack people. I'm trying to attack the spirit that is trying to take over this age. There, there are seducing spirits in the world right now. There are lying spirits. There are seducing spirits. And, and the seduction... Is, is not, I'm not talking about sexual seduction, although those spirits have been around for a while. I'm talking about a spirit that seduces you into a mindset that will take you away from kingdom purposes and will get you involved in battles that God did not build you for. Does that make sense? All right. I love you guys. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for... What I hope is your wisdom, Father, if, if I'm wrong on any of these points, then let them not be heard and correct me, Lord. But, Lord, I pray that you will give us wisdom to, to see your truth in the world and to see the strategies that we need to uh, engage in order to win the lost. Father God, the time is short. And, Father, we don't need to be fighting temporal battles. We need to be fighting eternal ones. And so, Father, I pray for everyone that we love and everyone we care about and even those that you're going to introduce to us in the future that we will be the people that they need to be able to see Jesus and to be able to come to you and to find you. And in Jesus' precious name we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. What's that? Oh, okay. Yeah, real quick. Um, we do have uh, reflections coming up. We now kind of know who is, uh, who is still going to be doing the parts that we uh we auditioned last year when we had to shut it down because of the COVID stuff starting. So there are some, there are some parts that we do have a need for at this point. Uh, here's the way we're going to do it. We're going to do video auditions. So if you are interested, then uh, just send a, an email or a te or message on Facebook or whatever. Uh, message on Facebook, just send it to the church. If it's an email, is it admin at? Info at. Info at info at allegiantministries.com and info at allegiantministries.com and just let them know that you're interested in doing that and we will send you uh, something to read and then you can just put that on your phone or whatever and upload it to the e Facebook or email or however, whatever's the easiest way for you to do it and, uh, and then we're going to uh, add our parts from there. Okay, so that's the way we're going to be doing that this year. If you already have a part, don't worry about it. You're already good to go. Um, but uh, but for those of you who are interested, and we wanted to make sure we got this on our uh, our video announcement because some of you out there might be a part of the community or something. Maybe you don't come to church here regularly. That's okay. We'd still love you to be a part if you'd like to be. Uh, the the um, the show dates will be Easter weekend, so that you know. All right, we good. Info at allegiantministries dot com or through the Facebook page. All right, God bless you. Have a great night. <laughs>